Hey guys, Kevin Pup here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show is managing partner at REI Doc Capital, Raj Vekatramani. Now, Raj is a world renowned pediatric cancer researcher, oncologist, real estate investor, entrepreneur, founder, and manager of REI Doc Capital. Now, Raj went to medical school in India and trained in London, Illinois, and California, and has a master's degree from the University of Southern California and an MBA from the University of Massachusetts. Raj has built quite an impressive multifamily portfolio in just a short five-year span. And so with that, guys, it's my honor to welcome Raj to the show. Raj, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Kevin, for having me today. Yeah, excited to have you here. Excited to learn more about um, really just your venture into multifamily. Um, I think more specifically, while also busily, uh, uh, juggling a very busy medical career. And so uh, excited to, to really chat about that and uh, learn more about that journey. But maybe, you know, I'll give you a very brief introduction there. Maybe um, I'll pass it back to you here for a few minutes. And for those listeners that don't know you, your story, maybe tell us a more about yourself, your your background, you know, in the medical field, but also you know, at what point in time you know, did you decide upon real estate, and then you know, ultimately, why did it become multifamily? So, yeah, I, I grew up in India basically, but when we, I went to medical school when I was seventeen, right? So the main reason I went to medical school, I may not be for the good reason. In India, if you're in a lower socioeconomic status, the the way you get ahead is go to a good school, engineering school, or medical school. So, you at seventeen, you don't know much, but I really enjoyed medical school. Then I ended up all over. I went to UK first, trained there, came to US and then trained here and become a pediatric oncologist because that's what interested me the most. And I went through an acad what you call as an academic journey where we do a lot of research, publication, treating patients, teaching medical students, those kinds of things. And I was always very, when I grew up, I was always very conservative, right? So you save money, invest, don't spend much. Um, those kinds of things. And I did that throughout thing and my career was doing great. Around 40 years of age, I see my, like, I don't spend much. My, I drew, drive like a 15 year old car, but I said, oh, okay, now kids are growing up. When can I retire? So I look at my retirement portfolio and said, hey, I did everything right until this point, but it doesn't look anywhere near I would have expected it to. Mm -hmm. What am I doing wrong? So that, that one plus, at that point, also, I had done very well in my career, so I was like ready to pivot uh, to something else where I can generate more cash flow, like uh, your podcast, generational wealth, time freedom, those kinds of things become more mm -hmm. important to me. So that's when I started looking into real estate. Initially, like everyone else, I started off like an LP investor, limited partner, mm -hmm. mainly for diversification. So all my money was in stock market. I was very conservative, all index funds. I didn't play around with much in stock market or anything else. So I started off as a LP investor, didn't know much about Balta family when I started out, uh, but I saw the returns it was generating. I started reinvesting every year and become more and more interested in, hey, what is this asset class? How are they doing it? And started learning about it. And la uh, last couple of years, I've, I've had more flexibility in my time uh, where I don't work that many weekends anymore. I don't work a lot of nights time. So I, I started doing this, wanted to do this more actively. So got to uh, talking to a lot of mentors, a lot of friends, were involved in multifamily and then decided to jump in myself. And it has been a great experience so far, learned a lot. And then I also help other doctors who are in my situation, invest in multifamily. Mm -hmm. Okay, fantastic. I appreciate that. And I'm just backing up a little bit, you know, when you uh, decided that you needed to be doing something different for your retirement than, than what you had done historically, um, and, and, and you decide that real estate was, was the potential path. Um, what did that initial journey look like? I mean, did you, uh, did you start reading books, uh, get on YouTube, start looking at videos, uh, go to a local meetup? I mean, what, what did the initial journey look like? And then how did you uh, settle on multifamily? So like, I think everyone, everyone, when they start out, I think the, the thing which comes to your mind is single family, right? So that's the one you understand the most because everyone has a house, your mood, sure. and your rent, and those kinds of things. So that's what I first started looking into. Hey, I should do single family. And I started reading a lot. And then the next thing was Burr, like BRRR was the big thing. So I said, oh, maybe I should do Burr. I should buy one house per year for 10 years. That, that's how I started out. I should have one mm -hmm. rental property per year for 10 years. Then I'm set for retirement. I'll have 10 rental properties, cash flow from them. I'll be good. Right? 
So then I went, started out, and then this was during COVID, and I go and look at these properties. The, they're all selling in the after rehab value, where you're supposed to be, get it at 70% of rehab, like after rehab value, but I could not get anyone because everyone is, plus everyone is putting cash and I didn't know how to get so much cash and buy a property. So then I learned about it. Then I went to like things like bigger pockets. The other thing which was very, very helpful for me is when I started a journey is I started calling people randomly. Like people are doing real estate, all kinds of real estate. So my goal was I'm basically an introvert. I, I generally don't talk to people that much. But during this journey, I forced myself to talk to different people. In a three-month period, I talked to like 100 different people. Who are doing various like, kinds of real estate. like what types of people i mean like you know brokers investors uh i mean just all so, across the board or mainly investors a lot of them are doctors some of them are not doctors too because i i'm a doctor so i connected with other doctors who are doing it hey how are you doing it? I, I spoke to a doctor who buys a hotel every year and then has a massive tax uh, uh thing depreciation from that and hasn't paying w2 i met a doctor who basically does a large scale flips like he, he puts things under contract for $3 million, $4 million, and then reassigns to someone else, right? He mm. negotiates and does this. So I, I met a lot of doctors who do multifamily as well, and short-term rentals, a lot of different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I learned from each one of them, and it was very interesting what they're going through. And then, of course, Bigger Pockets, a lot of books, uh, Joe Fallis's Best of a Syndication book, those kinds of things. So that's how we gain a lot of well, yeah. information. Then... This is the right one. For yeah, no, I think I think that's very helpful. And the reason why I asked that question, maybe we can elaborate on that a little bit, is is you know just getting out there, putting yourself out there, and 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 talking to that many different people gave you a very wide perspective. Where you know you just getting into it. I mean, it's, it's very near. You don't know what you don't know at that point in time. And so, um, I mean, the options that are available are really limitless. Uh, I mean, there's just so many different ways to make money in real estate. And so. Um, you know, I guess I, I want to dig just a little deeper because I think, you know, there could be a lot of professionals tuning in here that were maybe where you were at, you know, six years ago, just kind of starting that journey and and just not knowing exactly which path to go, not knowing really what all their options are. And I think having those hundred conversations in a very short period of time, it just probably, I'm guessing it sounds like it opened your eyes up to just, again, just a litany of opportunities out there. Ultimately, you settled on a multifamily, but, um, Help me better understand um, what was the exercise or what was the action steps that you took, um, you know, to, to meet all these folks. I mean, to just get got online and got on bigger pockets. Uh, you know, what were some of those action steps so folks can replicate that that are listening here? Yeah, a lot of these people are very generous, of, of course, with their time. Mm -hmm. So, I bigger pockets of one avenue I used social media when people put out stuff what they're doing. I basically messaged them saying, "Hey, it's really interesting what you're doing. Can I?" Can you talk to me for like 30 minutes? I, I'm mm -hmm. very interested in what you're doing. So I, I just reached out and I have ne never had anyone say, no, amazing. Everyone I reached out to were very generous with the time. They talked to me. They were very frank. They said, these are the advantages. This is, this one. This is what I went through. So I'm very grateful for all the people I talked to. And there's a lot of information out there as well, right? As you know, people are very generous with the information. You put a lot of information sure. there as well. Sure. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Raj, tell me what financial freedom really means to you again you you started this journey because you, you felt that you just weren't far enough along in your retirement phase of your life uh, at, at the age of 40 you know doing what you had done historically in the market um and decided upon real estate but again everyone's got a different definition and and really behind that definition is the why of, of why they are choosing to you know go down this alternative path and and or just change things up in their life of how they had maybe done it for the last couple of decades and so maybe tell i'd love to learn from you you personally what what does financial freedom really mean to you and what does it allow for you and your family? So for me, so a lot of people ask me this question, say, hey, are you going to quit? You're doing very well in real estate. Are you mm -hmm. going to be a physician? Are you going to quit your job? For me, the why is not to quit my job? Everyone says, hey, you should quit your W-2 job in real estate. For me, I can be a better doctor, better physician, better dad, better husband. If I don't have to worry about money. So that is that is that's what it means to me is I want to be a better physician. Um, so I don't have to when I my take my every everyday decisions, my work decisions, I don't have to have this thing in the back of my mind saying, hey, retirement, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Those kinds of things. That's the one. The other one, which also gives me flexibility, right? I can I'm not 
like forced to work if I don't want to. Mm-hmm. I can work as long as I enjoy what I'm doing, but I'm not stuck to my job. I'm worried that, hey, if I don't do my job, I cannot retire. I cannot have the same lifestyle I want. Mm-hmm. So that's what uh, excites me. That's what, why I do. Got it. Was it difficult to get your, your wife on board, to get the family on board with this decision? That's, that's really a great question. <laughs> because as you know, uh, I do I do full-time job, right? I'm the section chief for oncology in a large children's hospital. Mm-hmm. So that kind of, I have like 50 physicians who work under me. So that has its own responsibility. And this time, this thing I do mainly in the evenings and weekends. So mm-hmm. all my evenings and weekends are filled with phone calls, looking at deals, um, doing other things, marketing, those kinds of things. So the, my wife, when I started, she said, hey, I'm giving you one year. I'm going to tolerate what you're doing for one year. <laughs> and then if it doesn't go anywhere, you need to come back. Right? So, uh, But she sees how passionate I am in doing this and how much time I spend. Uh, so now she has become more supportive, I'd say, than when she was. She was very skeptical. And she doesn't like me. Like It's, it's a very big thing. Like, hey, you're a doctor. You need to be doctoring. You should not be doing something else. Why are you doing? You're, you are already achieved so many things. Why are you <laughs> going outside of your doctoring thing? Why do you need to do it? Yeah. I think now she has accepted it more. Okay. What what did what did that one year? What did success look like within that year span? Like what what had had what, what what did you have to accomplish within that year before she's told you to pull the plug or keep going with it? <laughs> <laughs> she she when I started out, she did think. Um, uh, people will trust me to invest with me in the first place, right? So now she's impressed. Oh, there's so many people actually trust you uh, and uh, respect what you say. So that's that, that's the thing. Like even my own wife, she said, oh, are they going to listen? Why should they listen? Even now she says, why should they listen to you when there are so many other people out there? I say, hey, because I've gone through that experience. I'm a physician and they're a physician. I know, understand their story. So that's why they respect me. So that, that was a skepticism initially from my wife. Yeah. She has seen what I do. And now she actually, for example, there are friends who came over and she answered most questions about multifamily than I did. And she was able to do a better job just listening to me talk to different people. That's great. I love it. I love it. I appreciate you sharing. And you know, switching gears a little bit, you know, I know that you know, really multifamily, it's a team sport. Um, you've you've you know, you've got a number of partners on, on a lot of the deals that you've done. Talk to me about the uh, you know the vetting process and 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 what that looked like for you and and how you ultimately you know decided upon the different partners that that you've uh, you know teamed up with on these different multifamily transactions. So when, when I started out, of course, uh, I I belong to a master what do you call as a mastermind group, and I have a mentor because I always have a coach uh, because as you know these are fifty sixty million dollar businesses. These are not like buying a single family, mm-hmm. so you need to have a good team. And who who knows how to run a business, right? So I joined this good uh, mastermind and we have a mentor there. Who t- and then I basically went through his guidance when I started initially. And we found uh, properties together. And then I joined who is mentored. He, we, we found properties within that mastermind group. So that's how I started. Mm-hmm. Um, so the wedding process for me has evolved over time. So now I've gone outside of our mastermind group and find other things. The things I look for first is the operator. So that's the number one thing we look for is, is it, well, how is the operator? Um, have they gone full cycle? Have they done multiple deals? And then, of course, I I interview them with an extensive list of questions I have. And at the end of the day, you go by somewhat gut feeling after you talk to someone. So say, hey. But as also I do like outside wedding. Like I talk to other people they've done deals with how the communication has been, did they do what they say they were going to do? Mm-hmm. First thing is the operator. Second thing I look for is the market. Of course, our primary market is Texas and Southeast because that's where all the population is going, the jobs are increasing, those things. And the third thing we look at is the deal. So that in that order, operator market and then the deal. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, we have our underwriting process. I do my own underwriting, all the, all the deals we get into make sure the numbers make sense. So I get the T12, T3, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And so those are the, that's the way I would do this. Okay. No I, no, I appreciate that. And let's talk about the first deal. I feel like the, you know, the first deal is kind of where the foundation gets laid. Um, lots of, lots of lessons, uh, you know, ultimately get learned on that very first uh, transaction. So what were the, the, you know, the three biggest maybe takeaways or maybe you can speak to maybe challenges or just, you know, lessons learned on that very first transaction. 
that, that's actually an excellent question, right? So you go into it and you think, oh, everything's going to be very smooth, all these things. And then the first deal we did was actually in June 2022, right? That's where the transition was happening. <laughs> Lots uh, of volatility that, there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, volatility, the debt structure was changing. So it's very interesting that this deal was like a $60 million deal in Jackson and Florida. We are buying like 382 unit property, went under contract, we raised money, and then there was a PE firm which had promised $6 million. Right. So we raised the rest of the money. We are going to close this deal. Of course, we had to retrade in this thing because of the interest rate and those kinds of things. But one week before closing, the PE firm said, hey, it's of $6 million. We can give you only $4 million. We cannot give $6 million. And then like 48 hours before closing, they said, we want you to have $2.1 million of that $4 million as reserve. Right? Boy. So now we are $4 million in hole two days before our closing day. And luckily, our, our mastermind group, the team is really strong. We ultimately decided that, okay, this doesn't make sense for us to get $1.9 million from this thing for the deal. So we actually said no to the PE firm 48 hours mm. before closing. And then put a GPs, put our own money to cover the gap. We closed the deal. Of course, we continued to raise afterwards, but we actually closed the deal and raised the, um, like we raised the money afterwards. So that was a good learning experience for me as a first deal because you're going through that. You have all your investor, you promise you're going to close, and then you get this hurdle and you need to get through that hurdle. So that was yeah. a good learning experience, kind of stressful experience for the first deal, <laughs> to be I honest. Bet. And after that, I've, I've learned a lot. I, I go on the investor call, like not investor, the property management calls every week, asset management calls. So we have learned the importance of good asset management. So we've caught a lot of things and what things can go wrong, how we overcome that. So there have been a lot of lessons learned. Yeah, speaking of PE firm, I'd love to love to know, um, and, and I know that that was your first transaction. But had had uh, had the group that you were partnering with had they transacted um, in, in prior deals with this PE firm? So what what, what happens? It's an interesting story. So we all knew our group is basically somewhat skeptical about having a PE firm to do this, but they came through a reference to our lawyer we use, right? So they said, "Oh, this group is very good. They have." I have worked with them. They've transacted. I think the they may have done very well in the past, but the debt situation volatility kind of spooked them, I think. That's why it happened. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know the exact reason, but that's our guess is because of the debt situation. A lot of things are happening around June 2022. I'm assuming you haven't used them on any future transactions, correct? No. <laughs> we haven't. Yeah. And our group, again, uh, that was, we rarely use the PE firm because we try to raise our money on our own. And that experience, again, made us more skeptical about, of course, mm -hmm. that, of course I'm not blanket saying all PE firms are there, but we have generally avoided if, if we can. Given the volatility in, in the market, have you noticed a shift um, on, on, on the raise side, on the capital raise side of just trepidation from any LPs uh, that, that might have historically, you know, been just ready and willing to put up, you know, six or seven figures that now are maybe taken, taken to the sidelines? Uh, exactly. So towards the end, we noticed it a lot. I think at least for my personally, I noticed like October, November starting last year. And it has stretched now to till now, right? So a lot of people actually say, actually said, oh, I want to put money in. And then they come back to you saying, hey, I'm really worried about the market. I'm hearing there is recession coming. Um, so there is, I think, very, the people I, people do have money and they want to invest, but they want to wait. That's what I hear mm -hmm. all the time. So, hey, I'm going to wait till the end of this year to see what's happened. So there is, a not only me, I when I talk to other syndicators and multifamily people, that's a common theme is that raising money has become more difficult. Has your group but seen a, worried. have you, have you seen either a increase or decrease in deal flow over the past, uh, call it, let's call it four to six months, um, you know, Q4 of last year through Q1 of this year. So what we did as a group, of course, I'm not, the, I'm a small part of a group. So we did as a group, we, I think we did 16 uh, deals last year. So there was a lot of deal flow and we haven't done anything on a new deal so far in the last two months. Right. So again, everyone is, there is a big uh, uh, bid, ask, bid, bid ask spread, right? So the seller's expectations and the buyer's expectations, there is a big spread there. Mm -hmm. The seller is still wanting last year's prizes, buyers wanting next year's prize, prizes. So that's, sure. uh, I think there is some uh, 
we have not a significant decrease and I don't think a deal flow, I think the deal flow is picking up, but we are not able to get come to an agreement on what the price should be. Or Got like, it. No, that, that, that makes sense. And again, just the uncertainty with uh, where rates are at and uh, hopefully we get some stability here in the coming quarters, but just, um, it's been an interesting uh, last, I guess, call it eight months or so. <laughs> For those, Raj, that want to learn more about you uh, and your group and, and the opportunities that you have, where is the best place to find you? Uh, so I, I, they can find me on my website. It's, uh, it's called www.redoccapital, uh, www.redoccapital.com. I'm also very active on LinkedIn. So that's where if you type my name on LinkedIn, you can find me there as well. So that is my primary method of communication to my investors. Okay. And they, if yeah. they go to my website, I have an ebook for doctors. So mm -hmm. specifically for designed for doctors of a passive investor. So they can download that free ebook as well. Fantastic. Well, Raj, it's been a pleasure having you here. Thanks for joining us here on today's show. Uh, thanks, Kevin, for having me. All right, guys, that's all we have for this week's show. So until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin, but wishing you huge success. Take care now.